Welcome to the seven and a half floor of the Merton Plummer Building. As you'll now be spending your workday here, it is important that you learn a bit about the history of this famous floor. Welcome to Malkovich Malkovich Minute Minute, the daily podcast in which we shiver with a spasm of ecstasy as we explore the film Being John Malkovich, one minute at a time. I'm your host, Austin Pryor, and I'm joined once more by Peter and Una. Come back in, get comfortable. How, how are you both today? How are you doing today, Una? Very good, very good. It's great to see you again. Uh, so today, I, I too, I too am well, Austin. Just yeah, that's just, you that's, didn't directly yeah, that's inquire, fine. but I I felt like the onus was on me to <laughs> contribute to. Uh, yeah, I'm fairly neutral on whether you're okay. I mean, I mean I'm sorry. Like, I'm, I was... I'm surviving. I mean, like you know, okay. I came, I came. Isn't that enough? <laughs> it is. It is enough. I was trying to be a, a bit Maxine there and uh, pretend I'm not a people pleaser and I'm not <laughs> eager for everybody to like me at all times. Okay, today we discuss minute 19 of Being John Malkovich. Minute 19 starts with Lester advancing menacingly on Craig and ends one minute later Ooh. with a well-timed interruption from Craig as he diplomatically puts an end to the erotic ramblings of his boss. So how do we get on with this minute? So it's it's interesting to have um, somebody uh, advancing menacingly who is costumed like Mister Rogers <laughs> and and speaks like a Hustler magazine come to life. Uh, if, if, but with if beautiful Hust- diction. If, if it was like a really sort of florid letters to the editor section of Hustler, <laughs> yeah, uh, Hustler yeah, magazine. Um, I would, I would just totally like to take a moment. I don't know if this has already uh, happened uh, in the show, um, but to figuratively pour one out for Orson Bean. Orson who Bean, is, yes, absolutely. Who is who is the actor um, behind um, the part of Doctor Lester? And yeah. it's sort of it's. So I, I just think again, we, we we've spoken before about tone and kind mm-hmm. of like you know the quality of performance and so on. I think I did the what he does with this role, uh, just how perfectly he fits this role, yeah. is is just worth kind of considering. So his casting alone, I think, is really interesting because he brings this sort of you know American gravitas. An mm-hmm. automatic sort of, you know, somewhere between kind of grand grandfatherly and avuncular presence. He absolutely gets how to play absurdity without milking it, without yeah. over egging it. Um, he gets the um, the weirdness right, but it doesn't seem cartoonish. He's earnest, but he's not deadpan. He's got like, he's just got like the balance of that performance is absolutely fascinating. It's just the right amount of weight to make all of like the absurdity sort of seem just about true. Don't toy with Flores, Schwartz. Oh no, if I was 80 years younger, I'd box your ears. I wasn't toying with you, sir. I wouldn't. Pardon me, how old are you, sir? 105. Carrot juice. Lots of it. I swear sometimes it's not worth it. I piss orange. Oh, and I have to piss sitting down like a goddamn girly girl every 15 minutes. But nobody wants to die. Ah, to be a young man again, eh, Schwartz? (laughs) Maybe then Floris would care for me. And he's just superb in this film as a centigenarian plus who has no relinquishing on his material or physical desire and mm-hmm. is willing to put in all of the effort to deliver on that, whether or not it has near lethal amounts of retinol and carotid. But the elderly have so much to offer, sir. There are link with history. I don't want to be your goddamn link, damn you. The delivery of the line, I don't want to be a goddamn link, damn, damn you, yeah, yeah. is <laughs> unimprovable. Is yeah. unimprovable for one is for one of the most drippingly insincere lines of the film delivered in a, a equally wonderful performance yeah. by John Cusack that the the elderly are our link to history. I think that's instantaneous, important rejoinder. And 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 as we find out, like so many of the what seem to be throwaway lines of being Joe Malkovich, it's not a throwaway line. And no. his refusal to be your link to posterity is 
is more than just don't you patronize me. There's actually something considerably more sinister at work in yeah. this figure, in this figure of Dr. Lester. Um, uh, so I, it's, I, he owns this entire minute and, uh, and several more to come. And it's just an expertly played, expertly delivered uh, vignette. Amen. <laughs> yeah, Orson Bean is a strange animal. Where did he come from? How did he get this role? I'm none the wiser after my research. I can't imagine anybody else in the role. I can't imagine why I've seen him in so few roles. His comedy timing and as you say his perfect pitch of how to play this is just it's a joy to behold <laughs> i would say to that point though austin the the fact that he is so cuddly the fact that yes. he is that he he has this he's got the quintessential non-threatening grandfather appearance mm -hmm. he's like you can you can imagine him as, as he was a sort of a game show host and a talk show host you imagine yeah. him as this this sort of absolutely ingratiating, comforting figure. So the juxtaposition between that and this kind of, you know, Rococo sexual desire <laughs> yeah. is, is, it's amusing and startling at the same time. Yeah, definitely. And also, he's such a beautiful speaker. He has such excellent diction. And of course, none of the jokes about his you know, I've been awfully lonely in my uh, in my isolated tower of indecipherable speech. Those jokes wouldn't land if if he was in any way less than perfectly eloquent and um, and and had beautiful diction. Orson Bean's great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I kind of agree that it's he's he's great, but I I find him really creepy, and you know mm -hmm. as. Uh, as, as granddads go, like, really creepy. Um, so, I, you know, I don't buy into this idea of him sort of being this avuncular, benign presence, and then it sort of comes out. I feel from the moment I saw him, I went, yuck. And oh, really? <laughs> he's, yeah, really unnerving, really. Like, I think Hugh Hefner, like, that's who he reminds me of. And yeah, that yeah. old man yeah. who's kind of, you know, going to be gracious, but is a bit of a wheeze and will pinch your arse on the way out. <laughs> it's even the way he's dressed. It's sort of, you know, he's, I mean, he's, for me, someone who's less threatening in, in an older guy, they might have, you know, their, their shirt slightly out or they're, you know, they have, they have a toy because they, they visited their granddaughter or, you know, whereas he's, he's quite <laughs> yeah. immaculate. And I mean, you know, he's, mm. he's, he's actually a captain from when? Do we know his origin point or we don't really know why that's the origin point because this thing could go back and back, right? Could go way back. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, sure. But but yeah, I mean, in some ways, he sort of raises the question of the portal because he's sort of the oldest person. Um, but but even just on face value in this scene where we're kind of getting to know him, like, I mean, I'm giving this as a totally 20, 21st century um, kind of post-Trump read. But I think the mention of history, <laughs> watching it now, um, and the sort of the, the kind of the, the presidential language of this like to link to history that, that sort of the, 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 the false note yes. that Craig hits, um, sort of and him pissing orange and, and talking about, um, you know, the, the pain of having to sit and piss like a girl. He he just reminded me of Trump. I know it sounds odd, wow. but I was like, yeah, I was yeah. imagining, you know, Trump. Maybe it was the color orange. I think it was the color <laughs> orange. It was, it was absolutely that. So I'm riffing off that and imagining, you know, uh, the foundation uh, it, under a sweaty bathroom light. It's all just pouring down <laughs> Trump's body and, and, and kind of mixing in with the urine. And, and that's really, <laughs> sorry, okay, I'll stop. But, but there's something about like that sort of history of men in power. I want to feel Flores's naked thighs next to mine. I want my body to inspire lust in that beautiful, complex woman. I want her to shiver with a spasm of ecstasy, Schwartz, as I penetrate her Dr. wet... Lester? That I see it as sort of about excess, that mm. sense of mm. um, the excessive flow of, of keeping going. So there's a number of points where yes. he could have stopped. Like, so he goes, and it's so well written, beautiful, complex women. So you kind of, as a woman, yeah. you stop and you go, maybe this guy, maybe this guy isn't yeah. going to go there. And then he goes there. And, mm. and um, you know, and then the other way of looking at it, I suppose, is he goes there because he's, you know, he's objectifying her. He's talking about opening her thighs and, and, and wanting to penetrate her 
Twitter and yeah. it's it's just yeah it's inappropriate but it's also him saying what he's really thinking like these are the fantasies yes. that are keeping him alive as a man so in the same yeah. way that we talk at the people who cut through the bullshit in some ways he's being his truest self as, a, as an old perv yeah. Um, yeah. and it, kind <laughs> of, follow your bliss it's like it's, mm. it's prurience as it, like it, it um, mm. what's the what's the word concupiscence here's 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 my <laughs> yeah, word 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 of the day concupiscence but con- concupiscence is like the desire and like absolutely it's you know malignant it's inappropriate and it can be threatening but it's also the desire that is toxic within it's corrosive okay. you know yeah. and it's and it's also i think kind of with it there's the understanding that it is unfulfilled that kind of like yes. that he is that kind of and and it seems to have grown to these exaggerated you know ex- extraordinary proportions because he does not find an outlet because he is he is similarly rebuffed mm. like he's like in a, in a weird way he could be Craig's future if you know the in the way that he's going to mm-hmm. go from to go from romantic to go from fundamentally chaste you know wanter of a woman yeah. through to something that's actually leering and grotesque and kind mm-hmm. of absurd and kind of comic and kind of scary because mm. it's just magnified, you know, like the yeah. kind of like a tamped down volcano, you know, it's not going anywhere, but it's going to, it's going to destroy. And it happens, it happens in a lot of, a lot of literature, you know, I'm thinking of kind of John B. Keane mm. plays that have similarly like malignantly frustrated yeah. Yeah. male characters, you know, and it's this sense of kind of curdled, curdled sexuality that began as, you know, the lustful swain and became something more monstrous and grotesque. And it's really interesting what he says. Nobody wants to die. And it's it's interesting that he says, mm. I don't wanna I don't wanna I don't wanna sit on a seat and piss like a girl. So his whole yeah. kind of version of virility is standing up, you know, pissing against yeah. a urinal and sort of this sense yeah. of you know, this makes us understand him a little bit, but he is, you know, he is still maybe a young captain in in his own sense of self. And so he's having to adapt yeah. to this old body, um, which mm. doesn't suit him at all. And um, um, there's that feeling that his desire in some ways is inappropriate, but also as, as, as we go on, what do we think about the fact that he then actually does um, end up with Floris? With Floris. Yeah. yeah. And he and not just him, but he and a group of elderly people. Mm. And we get the idea that he is the uh, dominant personality and that was probably part of the deal of everybody g- piling into the uh, the Malkovich vessel. But yeah. um, Ooh, but it yeah. finally makes him yes, the ro- it- <laughs> I never thought about the fact yeah. that he's an admiral and it's a vessel before. That's interesting. Uh, indeed. Oh, the Malkovich vessel, and he is a ship mm. captain. Yeah, yeah. I, I never copped that one before either. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't talk that at the that's a, that's yeah. an association. Um, I'm thinking now about your note about Trump. The fact that he's the kind of the model of a rapacious industrialist capitalist mm-hmm. acquirer, you know, mm. and then yeah. finally, kind of, because the, the it isn't it isn't so much that he kind of finally possesses Flores, so to speak. It's that he possesses Malkovich. Yes, that he's and in fact that mm. there's no question about his entitlement. To possess Malkovich, it's just a right. It's just a right yeah. of passage, and after Malkovich, it will be you know somebody else. Emily. Before mm-hmm. before Malkovich, it was Doctor Lester. So it's greed. The the mm-hmm. it's not just nobody wants to die. It's just I have found a way to be immortal, to cheat death, and yeah. there's no sense about the morality. It's just a fait accompli. Mm. Yeah. It's uh, it, he never addresses the monstrousness of what he's doing, and he's like he feels hard done by, because he he has to live till one hundred and five or maybe one hundred and six by the time Malkovich is uh, having his forty fourth birthday, so he he's he's annoyed that he has to stay in this Lester vessel that even that long, and and has to go through the pain of living that long before he gets to be forty four again. So just more generally, I wanted to ask you both about this film, how you came to it, 
and how it has changed uh, in your perception over the years. Um, like I've talked about my experience with it. I was uh, on previous episodes. I was um, 20 and, and happened to catch it in the cinema on uh, St. Patrick's Day in the year 2000, which is when it was released in the UK and Ireland. Um, so what stages with it without revealing ages, if you don't want to reveal them, but what stages in your life were, were you guys at and how has the film changed uh, to you over the years? That's a really, really interesting question. I'm, I'm surprised that it didn't get to Ireland until the year 2000. I, for, mm. whatever, for whatever reason, I, I completely associate it with a very small aperture of films being released in 1999. The big 1999 movies, absolutely. When I, a, so, and so I, kind of, yeah. and I, remember, I, remember, I remember also seeing it in the cinema. I was also, I think think still in college i think i was probably in my final year of college and i remember being so completely enraptured by it and feeling like the the particularly special element of it for me was i felt it could only work as a piece of film but not Mm -hmm. only not only that but it had sort of understood the possibilities of film and used them to create its own reality and it made this kind of glorious thing which you often want to find in fiction which is something that feels as though it's got levels all the way down that you mm-hmm. could that and I, I think to to some extent this this podcast would not exist if you didn't feel similarly and enough people <laughs> didn't feel similarly inclined that you could that uh that you could spend a lifetime inside it and always find something else around another corner always move mm-hmm. another filing cabinet and discover another tiny door i think yeah. i saw a preview of it through premiere magazine because mm. i think i must have had a subscription or something mm. and it came and it was a card and it was redeemable in a number of different cinemas in the uk and one in ireland and it was the savoy and me there and my go. friend porek saw it and we saw it in this kind of and it wasn't jammed it was like screen yeah. two or three or something and it was with a bunch of people and it was you know that feeling in an auditorium when you've all seen something, you don't know anybody else there, but you've all seen something mm. and you know it's special. Yeah. And there's a kind of, and nobody fucking leaves their seats mm. during mm. the credits. Mm-hmm. They all sit down and they watch the credits till the end and the house lights come up and people are still sitting down talking to each other and they're not leaving. That was the day I saw that film. I, it's great. only just come back to me now. <laughs> as That's a, amazing. As a, as a memory and I remember and all I wanted to do was see it again and I knew yeah. that I'd have to wait and I have and I can, and it's one of those films that in that kind of way that you collect things in new formats it's the one that I got on DVD and then yeah. it's the one that I got on Blu-ray and it's the one that I downloaded from Apple it's like mm. it's I it's it's I revisit it quite frequently and mm. I think maybe by dint of being old enough to consider Flora a viable sexual partner, it's <laughs> living living long enough to be able to see it at decent intervals in your life. Yeah, is really interesting, mm. and it's not. And, and like you know, I, I like when I watched it last night. It was the first time I think I've seen it as a father. And you know, yeah. I, and I got, it's interesting to sort of be that person who watches that mm-hmm. film, as opposed to to be somebody who's finishing their college career, and you know, to be somebody who is whatever scrimping out to see if this job thing works out. <laughs> you know, you kind of you you nece- it necessarily you respond or focus on different aspects of it. I also it's probably I I see it now realizing that Craig is not the protagonist. I see it now kind of as as the sense of, you know, consider finding Craig's flaws more immediately apparent. Yeah. Um, mm. So it's a film that I think kind of stays with me for good reason and a film that I'm very happy to revisit and a film that I still think it's really hard to think of either precedent or kind of antecedent. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't like it, it, it still seems remarkable to me in Kaufman's career and and like my my experience of the first viewing, it still seems like a remarkable film, a remarkable mm-hmm. piece of filmmaking. Mm. Absolutely. 
Uh, yeah. So, uh, Una, let's hear it from you. Well, it's it, it's funny. I, I guess I'm just slightly older. If it was 2000 when I saw it, I, I guess it was 23. And um, um, but I think you know when you asked me about this podcast, and I thought like the first person that sprung into my head very clearly was Peter Crawley. And and now having heard your memory, I think yeah. probably I must have met you before I saw the film. So you had seen it, I'd say, and we're like, I can't ah, even talk. Yes. I can't even talk. You have to see this. So I think like that's my origin point of meeting you and sort of, I think that must be true if you mm. saw it a little bit before. And then I don't remember where I saw it, but it was probably, you know, in a cinema in Dublin or in Cork at that point. Great. Well, I think it's come to that time again, time for you two to be ejected out of this portal. Uh, but I hope to see you back here tomorrow making yourselves comfortable among the goo. Absolutely. You're goddamn right you will. Good stuff. Hold on tight. Welcome to the seven and a half floor of the Merton Flummer Building. As you'll now be spending your workday here, it is important that you learn a bit about the history of this famous floor. Welcome to Malkovich Malkovich Minute Minute, the daily podcast in which we index, alphabetize, and file the film Being John Malkovich one minute at a time. I am your host, Austin Pryor, and I'm joined again today by Una Carney and Peter Crawley. How are we doing today? Good to be back. It's like Wonderly Wagon, you know, that moment where it goes <laughs> up into the house, up into the house goes up. Very odd. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's the second Wonderly Wagon reference we've had in this podcast so far. Yay! Assuming the first one didn't get cut and this one, etc. So today we look at minute 18 of being John Malkovich. Minute 18 starts with Craig saying to Maxine, I think maybe you're onto something, and ends one minute later with the beginning of Lester's warning to Craig. Don't toy. Don't toy. <laughs> um, that's all we get. So how did you get on with this minute? I love this scene. It's so funny. Um, it's great. The performances and the lines, boom. It's uh, There's a lot going on. I'm really struck by how the, the scenography sort of serves their relationship. The scenography, that's a new one on me. Um, sort of the layout, I suppose, of the... the Welcome to the seven and a half floor of the Merton Plummer Building. As you'll now be spending your workday here, it is important that you learn a bit about the history of this famous floor. Welcome to Malkovich Malkovich Minute Minute, the daily podcast in which we spill our goddamn guts for you as we examine the film Being John Malkovich one minute at a time. I am your host, Austin Pryor, and with me one last time are my guests this week, Una Kearney and Peter Crawley. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the All portal. right, folks. How are you feeling for your last outing? You feel ready? Looking forward to I it. I feel kind of, you know, mm. the, the tristesse of uh, <laughs> uh, anticipating an end. You know, I, I like it in this in this vessel. <clears throat> and uh, I'm surprised that this is our fifth and final ride. Yeah, yeah. I really should have a, a, another window open with a dictionary for uh, talking to you. But, uh, <laughs> but I'll, uh, I'll muddle through. So today we look at minute 20 of being John Malkovich. Minute 20 starts with Craig saying that the workplace is not the most suitable environment for this type of discussion and ends one minute later with Craig beginning his attempt to guess the name of his office crush. All right, how do we get on with minute 20? It is a gorgeous performance, that moment. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, the sort of, um, Craig is the kind of guy, I suppose, who digs himself further into further holes. So as he tries to get out of one, mm. he's, he's, yeah. he's, you know, he said he did the right thing and said the right thing, but it doesn't serve him. <laughs> Dr. When Lester? Well, I'm flattered you would share your feelings with me. Perhaps the workplace is not the most suitable environment for this type of discussion. All right. You're right. All right. I tell you what. Meet me after work today at Jerry's Juiceteria on Lex, and I'll spill my goddamn guts for you. That sort of masochism is kind of something that I think crops up with M. Kaufman a lot. The tortured um, guy trying to say and do the right thing and just making his own life miserable. And then, you know, moments later, we see him sort of be this astonishing sort of, you know, player in a way. You know, he's on the phone to his yeah. wife. 
<laughs> and literally <laughs> in one death move puts it down and it's sort of it's almost like she has a physical effect on him because he's sort yes. of you know we're seeing him tortured he's in the corner and then she comes in and he he transforms in her mm -hmm. presence yeah so um i'll talk to you later okay yep you too gotta go back to work okay bye hi do you know that i don't even know your name or where you work yeah and also, it's a little bit conceited. I mean, that's what's lovely about the language. It's like, can you believe that I don't even know your name yet? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, I'm so with her in that moment. She's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's and sort she, of like... she leaves it hang, which is amazing. She just, not only does she just flatly say, yeah, but she lets the moment hang. She just holds that expression. Greg is then forced to make the next move, which it's a pretty good move that like this, this game he introduces of... Um. Uh, Okay, how about this? If I can guess your name in three tries, you have to come have a drink with me tonight. Why not? Like, you know, pretty uh, you brave like move. A... Again, not great with the whole adultery part, but uh, sort of sort of admirable. He's learned something about, about her character since the last time, which yes. is he knows yeah. that if he introduces some element of unlikelihood or probability and it's the game and she probably thinks she's going to game well why wouldn't I play it I think her yeah. performance is incredible in this minute because yeah, yeah, you literally thinking, yeah. see her thinking he's going will you go for a drink with me and you can just see her going no 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 and then he goes if I can and it's like literally the length of that sentence you see her mm -hmm. and then she has this sort of exquisite moment of reflection and she's like mm, okay and it's just great yeah. like it's like it's like she's kind of gone Ch -ch -ch -ch. what what, what, what better have I? Not a lot tonight, so, you know, and he's not going to get it anyway, and I'm going to think of some great yeah. put to online. <laughs> yeah, to and end. it might be amusing for me. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's really fascinating. I mean, it's, it's so entirely in keeping with her character that she would see this as yet another essentially kind of transactional thing. Mm -hmm. Like, if I, can guess your, if I can guess your name, you have to go out and drink with me. I and mean, then we learn we learn later that she likes that she that her philosophy is that you need to go for stuff for people like people who yes. there are people who go for things and there are people who don't go for things you know yeah. and it's better to to go for things um, and that she is despite the fact somehow that she wound up in the seventh half floor of the <laughs> yeah. Merton Flimmer Building doing whatever it is that she does we do we, we never know what it is that she does she doesn't die mm. to tell us or to tell him. But she mm. kind of gets the, she, I don't know if she admires, but just acquiesces to the pluck of a guy who's on the make mm -hmm. and who has made a kind of a game out of it. I, 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 the, she's so indifferent as a character generally, you know, she's indifferent mm. to, she's fascinatingly indifferent. Yeah. So mm. indifferent to his commands, indifferent to desires, the, it, totally indifferent to this amazingly antisocial situation where can you, he says, can you believe I don't know your name or what you do? Yeah. And she says, yeah, not with malice, yeah. Yeah. not with, you know, like, like not, not as a sort of like in your face, but just matter of factly. Yeah. <laughs> That's I have I have not made that information available and I do not feel compelled to do so and she sees no problem with that you know she's entirely in possess of in possession of the rules as she sees them and the corollary is that she she sort of sees that she must acquiesce to this proposition yeah that it's a game towards something that he wants and therefore okay I'll take those odds let's see let's see where that goes mm. Really, really interesting. The 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 cutaway that I, I think kind of you, you tend to overlook is that he's fascinatingly honest with Lottie, usually. Yes. Like, you know, he's kind of like the phone call that he's making about why he's not going to be home. Yes. Uh, is because he's going, he's going out for a drink with his pervy boss who's going to kind of, you know, un, unspool these sexual fantasies at length over juice. Mm. Kind of, and he's, he's going to do it. Kind of, I, I, I think he does, other than, the fact, other than his desire for Maxine and how much action he's putting in to sort of, you know, uh, uh, to do the spade work, uh, so to speak, he tends to confide fairly readily what's yes. going on. Yeah. Mm. And Lottie accepts fairly readily what's going on. Mm. I'm meeting my pervy boss for a drink, but also I've discovered a portal in the office that leads to John Malkovich's yes. head yeah, and we're going on. to turn this yeah. into some kind of... 
industry, yeah, industry, everything industry for profit. Yeah. But in some ways, maybe, you know, you can always kind of take a step back and go, I mean, we're talking about puppeteering and sort of we're living in a world where um, so far we're not getting a sense of the female desire. That's about to change. Lottie's desire is going to be ignited and so is hers. Yes. But so far, we're very aware of male desire. Like there's been Lester, there's been Craig. Um, uh, maybe there's been a little yeah. bit of Floris, but it feels like... Don't forget like, Floris. Don't yeah. forget Floris, yeah. <laughs> Um, fair point but but sort of that sense of um, I do feel you can give a slight feminist reading to her character in the sense that you know she's a beautiful woman and she exists largely as an object of desire and she's wanting to earn money and have her own like she's wanting to be more in control of how yeah. she's being perceived maybe she also enjoys being desired in this moment too like there is a little moment of who doesn't like a little bit of attention sort of maybe that you know um Definitely. craig is being and so obsequious and it and it just it just chimes with her um power trip which is you know oh i get to sit in a situation where i'm wanted and i get to refuse and possibly humiliate this person and i get to feel that desire pointed at me and i mean then we get to this point where she she just flat out says it later in the film when she says uh do you have any idea what it's like to be looked at <laughs> by two people with yeah. total lust and devotion out of the same yeah. pair of eyes uh mm -hmm. you know she's just like that's that's what i'm in it for you know <laughs> Yeah, so in that sense, she is quite narcissistic. And I mean, wanting to gain control of things isn't necessarily feminist either, I should point out. But, but yeah, no. you know what I mean? And sort of deconstructing the sort of the, the power dynamics certainly alive at that time and sort of still kind of whimpering away at this moment. Um, yes. So there's something as well. I, I am always reminded of The Wizard of Oz at this moment as well, because it's like the moment oh, yeah? that's about to happen is fantastical. Like he goes, kind of three goes and he goes, in yeah. that scene. And it's sort of like you click your you click your your uh, heels, and I'm sort of amazed by this moment because it's sort of the, yeah. one of the most implausible moments in the film, yeah. and yet it doesn't yeah. feel yeah. It's, yeah. it doesn't feel wrong. Like, <laughs> is that just because the rules keep changing and warping? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think it is because you keep gradually moment. being absorbed into the quicksand of the sort of shifting logical kind of <laughs> plates. <laughs> that the, that the films like. I find it so I find it more in keeping with both kind of character con and consistency if we can call it that that she would go she would who, a person who has no interest in pursuing this person or having this person pursue her romantically or to go any further than that that she would entertain the overtures simply because she you know game respects game if you're going to turn <laughs> yeah. it into a if you're going to turn it into a game oh yeah well sure then cool yeah but the immediately more implausible thing is that the daftness of his, first of all, feeling out sounds with yes. his mouth, yeah. um, that he would be encouraged anyway by her facial responses. Yeah. That she, <laughs> this person, I mean, this person who, I mean, thus far, it has been set apart because of how unreadable she is, yeah. suddenly makes herself entirely readable like, you know, a kind of warmer, colder reception on her face as he feels his way through consonants and vowel sounds towards Maxine. That's, that's, it's, it's way more cooperative. Just in response to that, because it's sort of like, I feel like, again, the storytelling mechanism is that like Craig yeah. has now been painted as a bit of a loser, you know, and yeah. sort of at this point, he's showing that he has a talent, <laughs> yes. you know, um, that, that is sort True. of amazing and fantastical. True. And, and sort of um, in that in that sense of getting on board and going on the ride, we do like to feel that way about about our characters that they that they can surprise us, that they have something, yeah. you know, that that sort of a talent that speaks to. And then let's not forget he's a puppeteer. So if we wanted to read even further into it, you know, what is the talent of a puppeteer? And we we notice that like his style of puppeteering is sort of all about trying to transmit his feeling, isn't it, into these yeah. into these puppets. Yeah which I, certainly my experience of puppetry when I was a kid I didn't get that from it so when mm -hmm. I saw that he's that mm -hmm. kind of puppeteer so I can I can plausibly believe now that we're analyzing it in this step that there's something for his character in that scene yeah 
But also it, 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 it establishes him, I think, kind of quite firmly. I mean, if he hasn't already been established, it cements him quite firmly as the hero of the story. But so mm. it kind of implicitly it, it aligns us with the importance of Craig's want. Yeah. And mm. therefore that he is the hero of this story. And I think kind of the subversive thing about it is as the film goes on, it becomes considerably harder and harder to see Craig as the hero, either in kind of moral or... Um, uh, protagonistic terms. Yes. Do you know? Yeah. So he's, he's like, it's, it's harder and harder to condone his behavior, yeah. but then it's harder and harder to see Craig as the hero because he's not even on screen anymore, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, he's erased. He kind of disappears yeah. into it. Disappears, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, then, and, and, then, and then where is the agency? And, the, and, a fun, and the here, here's probably kind of where we, where we could afford to leave it because I, I do wonder about my own feeling about whether Maxine is the character who changes the least or changes the least over the time frame of the film. Yeah. Um, because I think Craig probably experiences a lot, changes in the most confirmable, obvious, physical way, yes. but doesn't fundamentally change no. as an individual. Mm-hmm. And finally, Lottie really does. Lottie kind of goes through the most important transformations, does actually get a taste of being other people, does get a sense of what her own goals in life could be, and winds up in a very different place, in a very different circumstance, which is kind of the fulfillment of her underlying desire. That's kind of, that seems like a complete journey. So and so when Cameron Diaz was unsure about the role, well, actually, kind of, it took Cameron Diaz on a journey in that character. <laughs> that, yeah. that other, sure. Otherwise, you might you might not have accessed. Mm. Yeah, the only other thing that I wanted to point out was a completely just, uh, it feels like a big step down to something lowbrow after all this highfalutin chatter. But what I noticed uh, just today for the first time is that about the 36 second mark, you can quite clearly see Spike Jones reflected in the chrome of the payphone uh, to the left of the screen. Oh! Well, I, I, I'd say quite, I, I say quite clearly, you can quite clearly see a person. Um, I'm not 100% sure it's Spike Jones, but I think it is. And I think he's observing the scene. So um, Yes, yeah, I can see can, that moment see of him. the head moving. Yeah. It's definitely a man's yeah, head. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, it, yeah, that looks plausibly like it could be Jones. He's got a sort of um, an angular yeah. face. Though yeah, his hair yeah, is and, dark. And... Uh, um, I think That's it's, funny. it's, 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 his hair is cut quite short during the filming. Um, so I think it's consistent, but anyway, it's, uh, that was just, <gasps> I couldn't believe I've been watching this movie so many times for so many years. And of course my, my attention was never drawn to the reflection in the payphone because I was watching <laughs> uh, a very compelling performance from, uh, from John Cusack. How many times have you watched this film? Oh, I, I mean... Uh, only once in the cinema, sadly, and then on DVD and Blu-ray over the years. I mean, not much in the last ten years, but in the previous decade, I just, I just couldn't estimate it. And we mm. used to put on parts of it to watch mm. for to 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 re-enjoy, and and it was just in in my kind of housemate situation. Um, it used to be just one of the big quoted movies so i i really i it would be tens of times but i really don't know uh i really couldn't couldn't guess and then when i was going out with my then girlfriend my now wife it was one of the ones that i was like oh we have to watch this i need to share this one with you and it was kind of a bonding one for us and um yeah so it kind of it has an outsized position in my in my brain so I think we're uh, we're running out of time. I think we're gonna have to say goodbye to the two of you. Finally, thank you both so much. And uh, before we go, Peter, where can people find you online? And what would you like to point people at? Uh, you cannot find me online. I have uh, jettisoned away from my social media accounts. Yeah, uh, I, I, I am. Was, I was hunting you down. Couldn't find a trace. I am off the grid, folks. <laughs> um, uh, if you're in desperate need of making communication with me, um, please uh, find a high voltage lamp and project my insignia onto <laughs> a cloud. I will see it from a rooftop and I will swoop down to make contact with you there. Excellent. Anuna? Um, 
Mine is far more prosaic. Um, I'm a filmmaker, so I have a website, yeah, which is, um, my, my company's name is Tirella Pictures, um, which is T-Y-R-E-L-L-A um, pictures, um, dot com. And um, I am on Twitter and uh, Instagram and stuff. But there we go. We've had uh, a lot of fun in the last five days. Yeah, I'm going to be sad to see you both go. But see you go, I must. I'm very deeply in control of this vessel now, and I'm getting very used to it. So I think I can I can expel you by will now. Let me just... Ooh. Thank you so much, Austin. It's been great fun. Welcome to the seven and a half floor of the Merton Plummer Building. As you'll now be spending your workday here, it is important that you learn a bit about the history of this famous floor. Welcome to Malkovich Malkovich Minute Minute, the daily podcast in which we shiver with a spasm of ecstasy as we explore the film Being John Malkovich, one minute at a time. I'm your host, Austin Pryor, and I'm joined once more by Peter Anuna. Come back in, get comfortable. How, how are you both today? How are you doing today, Una? Very good, very good. It's great to see you again. Uh, so today, I, I too, I too am well. Austin, just yeah, that's just, you that's, didn't directly yeah, that's inquire, fine. but I, I felt. Welcome to the seven and a half floor of the Merton Plummer Building. As you'll now be spending your workday here, it is important that you learn a bit about the history of this famous floor. Welcome to Malkovich Malkovich Minute Minute, the daily podcast in which we guess our way through the film. Star back rocky hard job being there being John Mac being John Malkovich <laughs> one minute at a time. I am your host Austin Fryer, and joining me this week from Time Warp Radio and Shock Treat Minute are Haley Mervini and Katie Tomini. <laughs> that was that's the best the coolest intro. intro. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it had every piece of theming that I needed. It had the the what we're gonna talk about today, that <laughs> yeah. it's all there. I love it. It's all downhill from here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of my notes. <laughs> Okay, so welcoming my new guests for the week. Tell us a bit about yourselves. Time Warp Radio, that's your podcast. Yep. It is. I'm Haley, so you know my what my voice sounds like. And I'm Katie, and now you know what my voice sounds like. But we may not sound at all different. No, I've I kind of heard that we sound the same, so it's when we're editing it, I'm like, did I say that or did she say that? And I have to look <laughs> at the audio file like <laughs> I'm confused, but hopefully that'll help. Uh, we are the the resident criminologists and resident counselors on our two seasons of our podcast, Time Warp Radio and Shock Treat Minute, mm-hmm. where we talk about obviously the Rocky Horror Picture Show and the sequel slash equal. Is it though? Oh, Shock is Treatment. It mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's th- this is something we were talking about in the green room. There's some kind of. Uh, discussion or debate as to what the connection between the two is yes there's definitely a connection because all of the creative team uh is basically the same it's been brought over from the rocky horror picture show yeah and they're so brilliant because if you consider that rocky horror is still being screened in theaters Mm -hmm. present day people are paying admission to go see a movie that they could probably find somewhere for free (laughs) or from a friend they could borrow a dvd from somebody uh that it's still relevant and Mm -hmm. shock treatment was oh man the boots were just too big to fill Yeah, they were really Mm. hoping to bank on the Rocky Horror fame and Mm. to jump on that same train, and it didn't quite happen, but they still made a pretty decent masterpiece, honestly. Yes, it's so good. It's so so bad that it's good. No, I would say it's just good straight out. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Well, (laughs) they're two very, very different kinds of good. (laughs) Yes. Maybe it Um, runs the gamut. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's that sounds fascinating. I'm gonna have to check it out. Yes, please. Um, so, so people, if they want to check you out, should look up Time Warp Radio on on their podcast. Yes, your any choice. of your favorite podcatchers, we are there. Cool. Yep. Cool. Okie doke. Today we're discussing minute 21 of Being John Malkovich. Minute 21 starts as so many minutes do with Craig's concentration face and ends one minute later with Dr. Lester about to tell Craig that all eyes are on him. So, uh, so the particular thing he's concentrating on here is this bizarre name-guessing <laughs> ritual. <laughs> you look like a... Carol Tavisher Suzanne Maxine Maxine Maxine? Yeah, who told you? Nobody told me, that just came out it was honestly, I, this was my first viewing of the movie. I'd never mm -hmm. seen it before. Mm -hmm. So I went into it pretty much completely blind, had no idea what was going on, except for it had something to do with John Malkovich. No, no, no. She knew that Charlie Sheen made a cameo appearance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she was like, how in the heck is the actual Charlie Sheen yeah. going to be? <laughs> so I went in, in and this, this probably was like my favorite scene, uh -huh. to be honest, <laughs> because it is so bizarre. And you're just trying to figure out like, are you okay? Like, Is, th yeah. is this man all right? Because he's not. No. At no. all. No, no, no. <laughs> but in this moment, he isn't just having a stroke. It turns out there's a reason he's doing what he's doing. It's so funny. I It, it lasts long enough that you get annoyed by it, and then it comes yeah. back around and it's funny again. <laughs> and I didn't... I, I couldn't tell if she was just pretending that her name was Maxine. <laughs> just to you make know? it stop? Yes. Okay, whatever. Sure. Because she wasn't going to answer to any name. He was going to call her anyway. <laughs> I was like, that's fine. Call me Maxine. Whatever. If this will end this moment, sure, that's my name. <laughs> that's... It's... I don't know. Is it ever... It, it could still be true. Yes. That, that theory. She could There's just nothing, be known by an alias. She could have just gone with it for mm -hmm. the rest of the yes. movie, which... <laughs> In, which includes her becoming, you know, a famous manager of her husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maxine Lund. Yeah, it could be, could be anything. When I initially saw this film, and even for a few times afterwards, I I didn't quite know what was going on. I still have some <laughs> questions because it's like it, it's it's a very strange moment, and it's edited sound editing and picture editing in a, in a in a way to throw you off yeah mm -hmm. absolutely and it's like i was talking uh, last week with uh, with una and peter you'll hear those episodes i'm sure we talked about how few kind of directorial set piece moments there are you know the like uh spike jones is very hands off in visual style it's very naturalistic mm -hmm. and it's uh he's not drawing attention to himself as a director for for most of the movie and this is maybe an exception because the editing is so strange and this bizarro we, we st yeah we stay on him so long with all this <laughs> bar <-cast>, ooh. Um, <laughs> and, and you just keep cutting like, back to maxine and she's yeah. just no reaction just incredulous <laughs> she can't believe well, that he's go he's still going yeah yeah that's what i always took it as i like there are moments in it when her facial expression really kind of has to be that she's playing along and giving him the indication that he's looking for. Because at the start, the first few looks she gives are kind of like, what the hell are you doing? Why is this happening? Which I think is, you know, stand in for the audience in that moment. Absolutely. And because um, he, he sets us up as a very conventional guessing game. He says, if I can guess your name in three tries. <laughs> And then <laughs> that's not three tries. That's either that's either one or thirty. You know, it's not yeah. it's not three. Um, and and I was 
I was uh, I, I went through it uh, for the first time, uh, breaking it down and kind of see how many. And I, I, I don't know if you want to count along with me, but I got like Bar, which could be Barbara, Ruth. He goes into then Pam, and then Lulu. Like he does a Lulu thing, which could be Lulu or Lula. Uh, if if you want those names. He's just going ha for syllables. Then you got <laughs> then you got Car, which could be Carol. Or Karen, mm -hmm. uh, he kind of slips in a weird Tabitha. Um, there's a fairly there's a fairly straight Sharon. Okay. And then there's Suzanne, which would stand in for Susanna as well. It would have worked if if her name had been either of them. Maybe even Susan might have mm -hmm. might have uh, got him along to that. And then he does an Emily, which is uh, but it's yes. a weird Emily. It's Emily, um, which is interesting because that's like the he's name retching. That, uh, you look, yes, how you yes. said it looked like you were about to throw up. You were like, <laughs> yeah, eh. or it's like an Emma and then realized that it wasn't Emma. So went into Emily. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that so Emma is covered as well. So Ooh. count Emma. <laughs> and then and then Mar. So that's got to be Mar Marjorie or the variations Margaret. of Marjorie. Margaret. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that counts. And then Maxine. So how, how many did we get to there? Twelve. Twelve. That's wow. why she so, gives him such little of an actual chance when mm. they do get together <laughs> later. She was like, you went way past the three tries, sir. <laughs> <laughs> she was never going to give him an actual chance. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was always for her own, for, uh, yeah, he was, he was going to be there for as long as it was amusing for her. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, there's a bit more to it in the script we'll get into the script maxine later. is such an appropriate name for her if it is her real name because <laughs> yeah it's kind of androgynous like she could go by max max yeah you know? she does go by max mm -hmm. uh, yeah and she's so hip and so <laughs> yes. chic mm -hmm. and she's got that mm -hmm. blunt cut bob like she's a businesswoman, and yeah. I don't think she works for anyone in the building. She just has her own office space there, right? Oh, interesting. Go on. Right? That's what I'm thinking. Like, <laughs> yeah. she, because when they were in the employee training and he asks yeah. her, who are you working? Where you're starting out. Right, yeah. exactly. She doesn't give him any kind of answer. And it feels like she's just leasing another office on the floor. It's very interesting you should say that because the the first draft of the script says that uh, Maxine appears to be using the orientation room as a break room. She's smoking a cigarette <laughs> oh. and reading her magazine. Uh, or the orientation so, is taking so place she's... in the break room. <laughs> uh, no, there's, there's, they're very specific uh, about the, the... In fact, that room is, uh, in, the, in the first draft of the script, is much more of a cinema. Ah. Yeah, so she's using that room as a break room which it kind of goes with your theory Haley that um she's not she certainly doesn't work for Lester Core she's mm -hmm. certainly not there for uh actual training mm -hmm. so she might be you're you're attributing this kind of uh, entrepreneurial vibe to her where she is just hiring out an office space yes i'm going to explore your theory <laughs> and if your theory is correct then there will be something let me get these minutes up um there will be something listed on the listings board for the seven and a half floor ah. that corresponds to maxine's business you <gasps> you're right because we do see that later yeah we see er, we earlier see earlier, earlier before yeah. he even gets yeah. in the elevator because he's like yeah. i don't even know where <laughs> what do you mean seven and a half lester corp what <laughs> yeah yeah What's on the seven and a half floor? We've got the law offices of Andrews and Barrett. Okay. We've got estate escrow service. Okay. We've got Leicester Corp. And we've got something called the Piper Institute. So they're the only four things listed on um on the seven and a half floor okay now, so which one of them out. which one of them sounds like uh, maxine escrow <laughs> because she's looking oh. for money i was gonna say a different one but continue continue she's like all about <laughs> making profit money off of, from yeah yeah 
So off the Malkovich vessel. Exactly. So I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, well, obviously, like escrow and that sort of stuff. She's already dealing with money. She's kind of money focused in her business. That one makes the most sense to me. Mm. Because I think the first three you listed are yeah. the other old people that are in like the cult. Oh, right. Interesting. You know, like mm-hmm. they're in the escrow mm-hmm. business, too. <laughs> Right. So why? So you you think when we see the old people in in the building uh-huh. in in the seven and a half floor, uh-huh. which well spotted by the way, I didn't notice them until this kind of viewing. Um, you think they're not just there visiting Lester to discuss some cult business. You think they're they have they also th- lease on that floor in order to keep themselves close to the, the operation uh, the, vet, the, the 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 portal yeah yeah, yeah. because i think sense. maxine is the piper institute okay because <laughs> institutes are usually fronts oh <laughs> nice usually just like yeah we're doing our own group study we're yeah. doing like a think tank we're working on something <laughs> that uh, if you want to buy into it we can let you know what what we're working on yes i think that she's um i got very much royal tenenbaum margot vibes yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. she with the blunt bob haircut and the cigarettes and kind of the icy oh yeah the flase da attitude (sighs) flase da da. (laughs) like Like it just gave me very much Royal Tenenbaums vibes. And I was like, yeah, I'm kind of into her. I yeah. like her. She looks like she could have family money that's now investing in an institute. Yes. The Piper Institute. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. This the world building we're getting. Done yes. Here, so. That's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. So Maxine says, I, I am dubious, dubious but, but I don't Welsh. Welsh. Do you use the expression to Welsh on a deal? No. Are you familiar with it? No, not at all. Okay, because I've I've heard it, um, and I've heard it as Welch, uh, like with a ch on the deal. But she's definitely saying Welsh, and um, yeah, it just means to you know default on a deal and not not come through, um, which is quite offensive to Welsh people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but there's no I looked it up and it seems to come from an earlier version which is Welsh which I was like oh well that just sounds like a separate word so it's not offensive to the Welsh but it turns (laughs) out that Welsh itself is just an earlier uh, arcane form of Welsh (laughs) so it's still offensive to the Welsh but I I don't know there's no there's no kind of origin for it but I know I've heard it before but I know um I like Welsh people, so I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to move on to the next kind of beat of this minute. We guess Jerry's Juiceteria on Lex. A hard cut. We're now somewhere else. Completely. The rest of his day didn't matter. The rest of Craig's afternoon. Yeah. From the second he got the confirmation from Maxine that he was dating her now. Well, that <laughs> courting. He has a time. A, <laughs> yeah. a time and a place to meet her. And now oh, all I... that matters is the like, oh my gosh, I'm about to be late to, mm. to seeing her. If I'm five minutes late, she's going to be gone. But he's also, he spread himself thin. He, he's just got off the phone from his wife saying that he won't be home late. He already knows that he's going to meet um, uh, Lester at Jerry's Juiceteria at, at uh, did he give a time? Yeah, no, just after work. And then, and then now he's going to meet her at seven. So he's doing like Alex P. Keaton vibes with, you know, <laughs> he's, he's like, this is, this is too much. He doesn't have the. He doesn't have a planner. He doesn't write down no. his his schedule and his tasks he flies by the seat of his pants he flies He's by uh, chimpanzee time <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. i i just i did a little bit of uh map research as well and the, the merton flemmer building is at the address do either of you know manhattan have you ever, have you ever been to I've new york been i there. love new york that's the next place okay. i want to move to for sure okay so the merton flemmer building is at 610 11th avenue Okay. And they're on uh, Jerry's Juiceteria is on Lex 
Now, Lexington Avenue is extremely long. It runs like most of the length of the, the island of Manhattan. And it runs parallel with Park Avenue. But like the minimum distance, like if, if, if Jerry's Juiceteria is located in the optimal spot uh, to be as close as possible while still being on Lexington Avenue. It's a minimum of 2.25 kilometers away. And in American, that's 1.4 miles. Thank you for the conversion. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so 27 minutes walk. Yeah. So, so then, and we don't, sadly, we don't know where the stuck pig is. So we don't know how, how fast and how long he has to run. To but get we to see him pig. sprinting. We, we, I, I don't know if I can call that sprinting. It's, <laughs> it's his version of sprinting. It's, it, it looks like the best poor Al Craig can do. But actually, that's in the next minute. So oh, we won't talk um, about it then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. We can't even know it. Nope, hasn't happened yet. So we're looking in the window of Jerry's Juiceteria and we see Craig patiently listening to Lester Ugh. and his amazing... Yeah. Uh, but even before we get in, there's just this establishing shot where we can see that, like, they they shot this in L.A. Yes. Uh, they shot n all the New York stuff in L.A., not in New York. And there's a lot of Spanish on, written everywhere here. And I don't think I'm, sh I'm sure there's Spanish areas yes. in New York, but I don't think Lexington Avenue has many. <laughs> kind of um you know spanish places what and, a good and call whereas out. i would see a lot more of that in la you can see that like even on the jerry's juiceteria um you can see uh frutas naturales is written across the which i i never even noticed that it wasn't in english i just saw fruit yeah that's probably yeah. fruit that's probably natural yeah, yeah yeah and then you can see you can actually see in the establishing shot you can see the reflection of another shop across the road from them across the street and it's like it's got more it's um damas caballeros and ninos um mayorio uh, like like wholesale men 